Okay, so in this video we'll talk about how animals are classified and lay out the, um, the big nine phyla that we're going to spend the most time talking about in the next two chapters. So zoologists have been arguing about how to classify animals since Linnaeus first came up with the idea in the 1700s. Because there are animal groups that have characteristics like this group and like that group, and sometimes it's not at all obvious how to classify them or what would be the best way to classify them. Uh, DNA has really been a game changer for this. Many, many arguments on how to classify particular gr groups of animals have been laid to rest by studying their DNA and doing a comparison of sequence differences between them. It hasn't solved every argument, but most of them. It's provided yet another piece of the puzzle to determine, because remember, phylogenies are supposed to represent what happened during evolution. And things that have more DNA similarities are more closely related, whether they look alike or not. Uh, so animals have different kinds of symmetry, and the more primitive animals either have no symmetry or radial symmetry. So radial symmetry is like what jellyfish have. They don't have a head and a tail. Uh, any way you choose to put a slice into them, they're, it's, it's symmetrical like a circle is symmetrical. So jellyfish are radially symmetric. Uh, sea sponges don't have any symmetry. Um, Although they're kind of, you know, roughly radially symmetric, it, they're not as rigidly so like um, the jellyfish are. So radial symmetry, uh, they don't have a right and a left. Now most animals have bilateral symmetry, and we can see the roots in here, the Greek roots, roots bi meaning two, lateral meaning side, so bilateral means two sides, so they have a right and a left. And that also means that they have a head and a tail, which means that by things that are bilaterally symmetric can move forward in one direction because they have a head and a tail. Um, and this eventually leads to the evolution of a brain and uh, a better nervous system. Um, and that means they also have, because they have a head and a tail, or anterior and posterior, they also have a back and a front, which uh, it, it technically we call dorsal and ventral. So dorsal for us is our back, ventral is your front. Uh, so there are some general differences between organisms that have radial symmetry versus bilateral symmetry. So organisms that have radial symmetry tend to be slow moving or not moving at all. They'll be sessile. That means they're, uh, they sit in one place, usually glued to a rock or something. Uh, planktonic means that they drift around. Maybe they can swim a little bit like, you know, jellyfish do propel themselves, but they don't swim in the same way that a fish swims. Things that are bilateral uh, tend to be more active. They tend to move with their head forward and have directional motion and be faster than uh, things that are radially symmetric. Animals have tissues just like plants have tissues and a tissue is a type of is similar cells with a similar function that are grouped together uh, and they're often developed into organs that are separated and have a, uh, an epidermal layer on the outside, um, or an um, epithelial layer, I want to say, not epidermal. Um, during embryonic development, animals have two or three germ layers. Most animals have three germ layers. And again, this word germ is now being used in the sense of germinate or grow, not pathogen like bacteria. So here we have a sea urchin embryo where we can see the three germ layers. We have the outer layer or the ectoderm which forms the skin and the nervous system. We have the primitive gut here starting to form. Uh, that is the endoderm. And then in between those two layers we have the mesoderm and the mesoderm forms the skeleton, the blood, um, and muscles. Um, so all animals, except for sponges, have at least two germ layers. And sponges even have, 
they have two layers, although we kind of exclude them from this, even though they do have an inner layer where their feeding cells are and an outer layer. Uh, but even the radially symmetric um, uh, jellyfish and uh, tenophores have two layers. And this image, I like this image because it you can see the two layers really nicely in this particular image. You can see the outer layer and the inner layer, and there aren't there isn't any cells in between. They don't have a mesoderm. They have the inside the endoderm uh, forms the gut and it forms during embryonic development and gastrulation just like uh, it does for the other animals. And the ectoderm forms the outer layer. So they would be diploblastic, meaning they have two layers in the embryo. So this is a sponge embryo. It's a little swimming uh, embryonic stage. And you can see that although it has uh, two kinds of cells, and these flagellated cells are going to actually end up on the inside in the adult sponge, um, it's not really the same as what the rest of animals have which we would consider diploblastic, which would be um, the jellyfish and the tenophores. They have two layers, no mesoderm in between. Um, so nidarians are the jellyfish. Uh, triploblastic animals, which is all the rest of animals, most animals are triploblastic animals. So they have, not only do they have an ectoderm, which is the blue here, this is a slice through an embryo. So this would be through the middle of the body of an embryo. Uh, we have the ectoderm, which is going to form the skin and the nervous system. We have the endoderm here, which is green, which is going to form the lining of the gut. And we have the mesoderm here, which is going to form the muscles, the bones, and the blood. Uh, animals have body cavities as well, and we call this body cavity a salome. And... Um, And uh, a coelom is derived from the mesoderm. It's in between the other two layers. And think about why that would be an advantage. Because animals that don't have a coelom have, they're just solid. They have three layers, but the mesoderm is solid. The mesoderm sticks to the endoderm, and the mesoderm sticks to the ectoderm. There's no cavity. And having a cavity is an advantage, uh, and it would be fluid-filled, not air-filled. So having a fluid-filled coelom would be an advantage. Uh, so animals that have a true coelom, like this earthworm, uh, would be coelomates. So their cavity is lined by mesoderm. So it's formed by either a po pocketing of the mesoderm during early embryonic development, or it forms by the mesoderm just opening during early embryonic development. But it provides an enormous advantage to the organisms that have it, and that's why most bilaterally symmetrical animals are coelomates. Uh, there's another type, pseudocoelomates. They have mesoderm, they're triploblastic, but they don't have uh, a true uh, coelom because it's not surrounded on both sides by mesoderm. They still get a lot of the advantages of having a, um, a coelom, but uh, they're called pseudo coelomates, uh, you know, which is, I don't know, probably not the best thing to name them because they still have a cavity. Uh, maybe we should call them partial coelomates. So animals that don't have a, a Coelom like flatworms. This is a flatworm, which um, you looked at those under the microscope. And they are called acoelomates. And uh, I have seen in a few places where people suggest that you pronounce, in, because normally we pronounce this, the C in coelom like an S, coelom. And they suggest that in, only in this word we pronounce it like a K a colomate. And to me, that's just wrong. That if you're pronouncing it like a C, coelom, then it should be a coelomate, 
So that's the way I'm going to pronounce it. Uh, so the mesoderm here is just solid. And this is a disadvantage compared to having a coelom, although these animals seem to do just fine. Uh, with this, they're certainly very abundant and diverse uh, with their lacking a coelom. So what, what advantage does a coelom have? Why did it evolve? They have this fluid-filled cavity surrounding the organs. Uh, what this allows is greater body movement. It allows a much larger space for gametes to accumulate. So if it's a female uh, and she's producing eggs and storing them inside of her body cavity, if she has a coelom, those eggs can just pour out into that big cavity. Um, it allows better muscle movement. Uh, because instead of having everything all just stuck together, now tissues can move and slide past each other because they're not attached. They have this big watery cavity inside of there. Uh, so it was, it was an advantage because once it evolved, uh, the coelomates became dominant. All right, there are two basic kinds of development with animals, uh, protostome and deuterostome. And it used to be thought that this would be a great way to divide up animals, that this must represent some fundamental split in the evolution of the animal kingdom, sort of like uh, the division between uh, bacteria and archaea, a fundamental split that we can count on to use to divide up animals. And it turns out that that was not the case, <laughs> that amongst the deuterostomes, some of, if you try to make it into a monophyletic clade, some of the ones in there are not really deuterostomes and the same with the protostomes. So although it is used as a way to classify animals, uh, the deuterostomes and the protostomes do not form monophyletic clades. Um, but what they represent are ways that the egg first, the fertilized egg first starts to divide, which is what we call cleavage, those first few cell divisions where there's no growth or change in size. Uh, the formation, how, this, how the coelom forms from the mesoderm. Um, and what happens to the blastopore? So this hole here that forms during gas relation, this hole is the blastopore. And what this hole ends up forming, it is one of three things. Either this forms the mouth, this forms the anus, or it closes up and forms nothing. Uh, and that's really the what happens to this blastopore. So here's another sea urchin embryo with its little uh, gastrulation is starting here. The formation of the primitive gut is starting. So if it's a protostome, that means uh, that the mouth is going to form from the blastopore. The word itself, protostome, proto means first, stome is from the Greek root for mouth. So protostome literally means first forms the mouth. Deutero is second, so deuterostome means second forms the mouth. So that means the blastopore becomes the anus, and what happens usually is this archeneron fuses over here somewhere, and then the mouth forms over here, because of course the gut has to be continuous uh, from mouth to anus. So that's generally what protostome and deuterostome development look like. And animals that are in the same phylum, uh, for the most part, are the same type of early development. Uh, so here's our two types here. So for a protostome, I mean, once the, this is later, like very late gastrulus stage. So the gastro, gastrulation has occurred. We have our primitive digestive tube here. So for protostomes, the blastopore, down here develops into the mouth of the organism. For deuterostomes, which were deuterostomes, uh, echinoderms, starfish, and sea urchins are also deuterostomes. That blastopore forms the anus and the mouth is formed where that archeneron touches the edge of the um, blastula um, that eventually forms the mouth. So mouth forms second. Um, so the history of when animals first appeared. So the Cambrian explosion about 500 million years ago, most of the phyla that are around today are found. We have fossils of 
almost all of the phyla that are still around today. And there are also some animals that are probably members of phyla, phyla that are extinct, that we can't match them with any phyla that are alive today. Um, and although there are a lot of phyla, um, there's about about 36, and I and you'll notice that it's not exact. We don't say exactly 36 uh, because it depends on how you group them. There are some arguments going on about whether particular organisms belong in two separate phyla or whether they belong in one phyla. New phyla are just new phyla are discovered occasionally. A new animal phyla was discovered about 20 years ago, with a single species being discovered that was so different from anything else it had to be put in its own phylum. Um, but there's about 36 right now, and there are nine that represent over 90% of animals alive today. So those are called the big nine. The big nine phyla are, if you add up all the animals in the big nine phyla, they're more than 90% of the of all the animal species that we know of. So we're going to spend a lot of time on the big nine. And a few other ones that we're going to talk about are ones that are important for understanding the evolution of animals, even though they don't have a lot of species in them today. And sometimes they're just cool, like tardigrades, which are in their own phylum, but they're uh, only a few species uh, known. Uh, does a few dozens of species, I think, uh, but they're they're very cool. So even though they're really sm they're not in the big big nine phyla, we still like to study them. So how do we decide whether they belong in their own phylum? Whether how to group things together into phyla? Well, it used to be completely based on development, adult morphology, larval morphology, things that we could see with a microscope. Uh, but DNA changed all that uh, in starting in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, now we can compare we can compare our ribosomal RNA just like Carl Woese did to study bacteria and archaea. We can look at particular types of genes like the Hox genes, which are early developmental genes. We can compare mitochondrial genes. Remember, the mitochondria have their own dozen or two chromos or genes on their little circular chromosomes. Uh, and we can, we can compare any types of genes in the nucleus to try to determine who's more closely related to who, even though their morphology doesn't help us group them together correctly. Um, and this has made a huge difference in animal phylogeny. Uh, we've been able to group them together much more uh, satisfyingly <laughs> and with fewer arguments now that we can sequence the DNA of everything we want cheaply and easily. It's made a huge difference. Um, so five important points about the relationships among living animals that are reflected in their phylogeny. So one thing that has been very well confirmed with all of the DNA analysis that's gone on in the last 30 to 40 years is that all animals, in fact, share a common ancestor. The animal kingdom is monophyletic. It's a single clade that has a, an ancestral species that is the ancestor of all animals. Sponges are the most primitive animals. Uh, sponges are the the uh, um, they were probably the first animals were sponges, and they're still considered uh, genetically. If you look at the DNA level, they are the sister group to all the other animals. Um, and in fact, we take all the other animals and call them the eumetazoa or the true animals, the animals with tissues, because sponges don't really have tissues. They have a few specialized cells, but they don't have tissues tissue types in the same way that um, the rest of animals do. They don't have true endoderm and ectoderm, for example. Um, most animal phyla are bilateral. Um, and we'll, we'll spend some time talking about invertebrates in the next chapter, and then we'll talk about chordates and vertebrates in the chapter after that, uh, even though most animals are invertebrates. So an invertebrate is any animal that does not have a bony backbone. So all the vertebrates are in one phylum, chordata, that were vertebrates, were in chordata. And we'll talk about a couple of the types of chordates that are not vertebrates in the next two chapters here. 
So most animals are not vertebrates. Although when we say animal, if you say, I saw an animal outside, most people immediately think you're talking about uh, some sort of a vertebrate. But really, an animal could be a sponge or a bee or many other things, as we'll see. So we're going to expand our usage of the word animal. So here is all of the animals. Uh, well, not all 36 phyla. Um, but the ones that are the big nine, these are the ones we're going to spend the most time talking about. And here's the sponges, periphera. Uh, the sea jellies and hydra are in the nidaria, and this is also a big phylum with many, many species. Echinoderms, this includes starfish um, and chordates. Oh, oh, also in the echinoderms are sea urchins, so a lot of those embryos that I've been showing you have been sea urchin embryos. And uh, chordates, that's our phylum. Flatworms, platyhelminths. And this literally means flat worm in Greek. Platy is flat, helminth is worm. So platy helminth is flat worm. Uh, mollusks, uh, which are uh, everything that secretes a shell, and also octopus and squid are mollusks. Annelids are all the segmented worms. Nematodes, the non-segmented worms, and arthropods. Everything with a hard chitin shell and jointed legs is an arthropod. Uh, and then we'll talk about a few other ones as well um, that are interesting from an evolutionary point of view, but uh, aren't in that aren't in the big nine. Um, some of these aren't even phyla, like Acela is a subphylum, uh, not a phylum. Um, so that's what we're going to cover in the next two chapters, is we're going to start with the all the invertebrates, which is pretty much everything except the chordates, and then the next chapter will be the chordates. So the, oh wait, let me go back. I didn't, I got to point this out. So okay, um, these groups here of invertebrates are divided into two big important groups, and this is one of the really critical things that DNA evidence helped hammer out is dividing up the ectozoa and the lophotrochozoa. Um, and it was always debated who's more closely related to who among these organisms because the segmented ones tended to get put together. So annelids and arthropods were grouped together because they're both segmented. And it turns out that, in fact, they are much more distantly related and they belong in separate uh, groups. So these groups would be above the phylum level. Lophotrochozoa and ectozoa are above phylum level because they have several phylums grouped together into them. Um, the ectozoa, these are organisms that shed a hard ectoskeleton. So for uh, Arthropods, this hard uh, exoskeleton is made out of chitin, and they outgrow it, and then they shed it. So that they have that in common. And the, the Lophotrochozoa, these are um, organisms that have some kind of uh, filter feeding mechanism, either as an adult, because they have a lophophore as an adult, or they have a larval stage that is a filter feeder. That's a trochophore larva. And DNA has shown that these organisms should be grouped together, that they have a common ancestor. So this is what an adult lophophore feeding structure would look like. And this is what the filter feeding larva, the trochophore larva, looks like. So every organism in that group either has this kind of a feeding structure as an adult or as a larval stage has that kind of a feeding structure. And this was one of the um, bigger arguments <laughs> in uh, animal phylogeny was how to group these together. All of these invertebrates here, who is more closely related to who? Because they're all so different um, and it turned out that the common way of grouping them was wrong. <laughs>
so it's always good to have data. So some of the questions that are being looked at today in by people who are using uh, mostly molecular data to try to answer these questions. One question is, are all the sponges monophyletic? Did sponges arise more than once? Um, are there sponges that are more closely related to the rest of animals than other sponges? Um, not very many sponges have had their DNA sequenced, so this is that's going to be a big effort. Um, what about the tenophores? These are the comb jellies. They're really odd, odd animals. And are they basal metazoans, not uh, uh, most closely related to sponges? They haven't had very many of them uh, studied on a molecular level. So that's another question. Are acelomate flatworms basal bilaterians? So if you're looking at only the bilateral, bilaterally symmetric animals, which ones are the closest to the ancestor of all the bilaterians? That's another question to be answered. And it's possible that the, uh, um, the subphylum Acela uh, is going to give us some clues to that. Okay, so in the next chapter we're going to talk about the invertebrates. Um, and all of the different uh, classifications and the, the uh, invertebrates that are in the big nine phyla especially. We'll focus on them. So for each of those, as you're thinking about each of those um, phyla that we're going to learn for the invertebrates and for the chordates, think about what characteristics define that group how it fits in with the rest of the animals, who it's more closely related to, what special new adaptations does that particular group have that evolved by natural selection. So think about those things when we get to the next chapter.